Hey, Bulk. Circus really in town? No, because we covered that episode last year in the all-new Mighty Morphin Jew Rangers. Welcome back to the all-new Mighty Morphin Jew Rangers for 2022. If you're new, this is the video review series where I pit an episode of Power Rangers against the Sentai episode it's adapting to see who did it better and what crazy concessions it had to make. I'm looking forward to a lot of zany new comparisons this year. But I have to be honest with you, today's two matchups are as boilerplate as they come. If anyone was looking for standard, run-of-the-mill, no-surprise representations of what you could typically expect from Kyoryu Sentai Judenja and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, these are the ones I would direct you to. If you looked up status quo in the dictionary, these are what you'd see. We have Kid of the Week, we have Bulk and Skull Antics, we have Tommy missing until the last possible moment, Monster Grows, Fight Fight Fight, Funny Coda. Yeah, I know, I'm doing a really good job of hyping up the video you're about to watch, aren't I? Well, just keeping it real for you, and it doesn't mean there's nothing of adaptational interest here. So enough of my gums flapping, let's get right into it. Which requires me to continue talking, so I don't know why I said that. Anyway, The Trouble with Shellshock vs. Hope Springs a Turtle. Both episodes are similar in many respects. The bumbling comedic henchmen go behind their boss's back to make their own monster, a tortoise or turtle with a traffic light sticking out of him that allows him to either stop a victim or force them to continue whatever they're doing. The yellow-colored ranger is hit with the go beam while the other three backups are hit with the stop beam. That is about where the similarities end, but as far as the broad strokes go, that's a lot. Power Rangers doesn't sub in something completely unrelated or strip the monster of his unique abilities. However, once we get to the finer details, Power Rangers goes off in quite a bit of a different direction. I mean, the sport in Jew Ranger is dodgeball. Why did they change it to basketball? Crazy. Yeah, okay. It sounds like I'm really having to dig to find things to talk about here. Actually, I'm relatively surprised Power Rangers carries over a ball-based sport at all, considering that it's basically window dressing and could have been discarded entirely without changing much of the plot. It's not like the ridiculous sneezing soccer balls is what I'm trying to say. It is interesting how differently the two beginnings are framed. The trouble with Shell Shock opens on the Rangers. It's their story from their perspective. The episode even adds in a new costumed shot of Squat spying on them, just to serve as a transition into the actual opening scene of Hope Springs a Turtle. That episode opens with Bookbok and Totepot, from their perspective on their plot. This is essentially the same scene as it's the same footage and the dubbed over dialogue captures the same essence. I was pleasantly surprised to find though that Jew Ranger includes a little more motivation to why Totepot wants to do this. He's jealous of Lamy, complaining that they haven't had anything to do since she showed up. And sure enough, once their plan appears to work, Bondora offers to make them top executives. Likewise, Pleprechaun doesn't approve of the Dora tortoise they made, now jealous that his own work is being supplanted. None of this is included in the trouble with Shellshock, even though all of it could have easily been adapted. Instead, Power Rangers replaces that stuff with a new, fairly generic scene of Goldar chewing them out for operating on their own. And funnily enough, Goldar is now back to his early voice in this episode. Rita's not going to be happy when she finds out what you've done. Go figure. As much as I like this, I'd argue the Lamy motivation would work better if it had been placed a bit later in the series, after a stretch of episodes where these two characters don't get to do anything. It seems a bit too soon here. Lamy just showed up and these two have been as active as ever. It also doesn't help that Lamy never does anything to make Totepot and Bookbok feel underappreciated. Heck, she doesn't even appear in this episode. So while it is a motivation, it's more informed than organic. As I said, dodgeball is something of an incidental part of Hope Springs a Turtle. It's a framing device, the game the kids who are attacked happen to be playing. But it doesn't have a specific role beyond that. Basketball is pretty much all the Power Rangers do in this episode. I honestly began to think I'd stumbled into a 90s Reebok commercial there are so many vanity shots of characters sinking baskets. If there's any character work being done, it's in the basketball scenes. Zack is arrogant in his skill, but in a charming, playful way. Tommy gets to develop his place in the group, forming something of a friendly competition with Zack. 
And remember, this is the first MMPR episode that aired after Tommy joined, and we never got to know him during his introductory episodes, so it's important to establish where his temperament fits in this group. Billy gets to surprise everybody at the end by beating Zack at his own game. This is all fun. There are only two problems here. None of this has anything to do with the story. And while it's good character development, it's largely for the wrong characters. See, this is a Trini episode. I think. Trini is the Power Ranger hit by Shellshock's Go Beam. She's the one who ultimately finds the magic flower necessary to stop Shellshock and free everyone from his attacks. But here's the problem. Once she's hit by the Go Beam, she basically disappears from the episode. We don't even see her receive her quest. We just hear Zordon tell Jason that he told her at some point to go do that. Oh, I just said, since you're already running, can you go pick me up some flowers? Yeah, I'm sure teleporting Jason there wouldn't be any faster. The only other things Trini does is sit on a bench and buy hot dogs. Look at that! She's the focal character, but her role is smaller than any other ranger! The show focuses on hot dogs more than it does on her. It's May falls asleep all over again. It's no surprise that Love Springs a Turtle is far more focused in its narrative and its central character. The story is about people being attacked by a monster with a unique skill. It's not just four Zhu Rangers who fall victim to this, the entire city does. The trouble with Shellshock really needed a juice bar scene where Ernie can't stop dancing or something. But that would have distracted from the pointless basketball stuff. I love how over-the-top Zhu Ranger treats this rather silly affliction, with children in the hospital who just can't stop throwing dodgeballs and apoplectic mothers sobbing hysterically. It goes all in with this. And of course, Boy being afflicted with the Go Beam is actually a significant part of the episode. We see Geki explain the flowers to Boy, having to ride alongside him on his motorcycle to do so. And while both solutions are rather generic, there's a bit more to Zhu Rangers. Boy isn't the one to get the flowers just because he happens to be heading in that direction. The mountain they're on is only visible to people who have been afflicted by Dora Tortoise, and Boy's specific motion leaves him capable of carrying it out. Since there's little inherent tension in a guy who physically can't stop running, being tasked to run to a specific location, the caveat is that Boy can't lose hope. The mountain seems to be moving farther and farther away, and if his resolve falters, it will disappear entirely. Like in so many other episodes, he must remember his dear child friend he cares about so much who we'll never see again, and hang in there in order to save him. It's pretty bog-standard stuff, but I do love how the climax of the entire episode hinges on Boy tripping over a rock that causes him to turn in the wrong direction. Again, this episode is stupid, but it goes all in. Power Rangers doesn't have any of this. Trini simply finds the flowers. We spend literally 15 seconds with her before she spots them. What a journey. Given what the trouble with Shellshock leaves out, I'm amazed it keeps this in. The Saber Tiger appears to Boy and gives him encouragement. Makes sense. In that show. Makes no sense in Power Rangers, but they keep it anyway. With Zordon saying the Sabertooth Tiger will guide Trini. Somehow. And then it telekinetically puts the flowers in her hand when she's right next to them, because she couldn't have picked them up on her own. I guess. Then she starts speaking in incantations. By the power of the saber Tiger, I command you, release us from Shellshock's power! And calls Tommy Billy by mistake. Jason, <laughs> Billy! I've got the Neander flower! I don't even know what's going on. There was a point I literally didn't know what was going on due to some understandably choppy editing. When the other rangers are hit by Shellshock's stop beam, I thought it hit all of them. I was surprised to see Jason was still in action. I had to run it back to see if I missed something. That's because in the Zhu Ranger footage, Boy appears, still running, and knocks Geki out of harm's way. Obviously that bit couldn't be used, so what's left goes by too fast to really read. But it serves as another example of how Boy is far more important to his episode than Trini is to hers. This episode does establish the Great Tommy Excuse trend, in order to get him out of the way to match the Zhu Ranger footage, Tommy leaves the basketball game for karate practice. 
It doesn't get more generic than that, but it is the first one, so I can forgive it. And this definitely gives Tommy more to do than Barai, who shows up to play his flute, and that's it. It's the second episode in a row where Barai doesn't do anything beyond that and doesn't even transform. Power Rangers does think Barai's appearance is cool enough to use, so even though they cover it with an effect, if you look carefully, you can see Barai before the reused Dragon Ranger footage comes in. So, that's it. Both of these are what I would typically expect from their respective series so far. Neither one really stands out from the pack all that much, but neither do they fall to the bottom of the heap. For story, it's Zhu Ranger. This is a much more focused episode, and because of that, it gets far more mileage out of the concept. For characters, Power Rangers utilizes a lot of its cast better, but like I said, it's the wrong members. On the other hand, this is the same boy plot we've already gotten in the same vein as Boy Can't Stop Sneezing and Boy Has to Eat a Carrot to Save His Friend. Quantity doesn't trump quality, but in this case it's enough to somewhat balance things out. I'm gonna give it a tie. And for action, Power Rangers really doesn't lose much here. In fact, it gains a decent full team putty fight. I don't know why Zack sinking a basket causes them to disappear, but eh, whatever. I'm gonna give this one to Power Rangers, which means we end with a tie. And that is the biggest concession I can make to MMPR because the story in Zhu Ranger is so much tighter by comparison that were I not scoring this according to categories, I'd definitely give the win to it on that alone. But here we are. How did these two matches end up next to each other? Why would Zhu Ranger produce such similar episodes back to back? Here in Zhu Ranger, we have another episode where a team member has a relationship explained through flashback. It's another episode where Barai only shows up to play his flute. Children once again wind up in a hospital. In Power Rangers, Tommy is again too busy with karate practice. The individual robots have more of a role than their combined counterparts. This is crazy. To break it down, in both episodes, the villain swaps out a treasured statue with an evil duplicate covered in butterflies or moths that put children to sleep. There's also a spider-themed monster to be taken out. Like our last matchup, Power Rangers stays relatively close and doesn't go in absolutely crazy directions. It places its focus on the same character, the Mammoth or Black Ranger, and actually focuses on that character rather than pretending it does. Power Rangers even includes children as the victims, although generic unnamed children, not anyone Zack specifically cares about. Instead, Zack ties into the overall story by being deathly afraid of insects and arachnids. That works okay. It's definitely the kind of Ranger Learns a Lesson plot the show typically does, and it's the kind of story that would typically replace the I Need to Save a Kid plot that Jew Ranger typically does. All the pieces fit into place. It's not like Trini's fear of heights having nothing to do with the monsters of that episode. Power Rangers sees a spider-themed monster and gives a character a spider-themed fear. This should be a pretty simple slam dunk, but like with the competitiveness with Lamy, it just doesn't go as far as it needs to. There's never really a point where Zack is tested. Even Trini gets that with her fear of heights. Zack never shirks his responsibilities. He runs away from the butterflies because there is a tangible danger to being near them. Not because he can't control his fear. He never learns anything or has to overcome something difficult. He just has a fear of spiders. He fights a spider. The end. It's fine. It just doesn't really connect. Power Rangers also struggles to incorporate the statue. There is a statue here. It does play a big role. It just doesn't play a very consistent role. In Zhu Ranger, the Fairy of Forest statue is newly unveiled. Goshi's friend, a lover of nature, sculpted it, but has since passed away. Now Goshi has befriended the man's two young children. It was the artist's desire for the statue to represent his beloved beech trees, as a home to insects and birds. Bondora corrupts the idea so that harmful, sleep-inducing insects are drawn to a forgery instead. Ultimately, Goshi has to destroy the fake statue, despite the young daughter not immediately understanding that it's a copy. The ending is actually rather bittersweet. The statue doesn't come back at the end as Dora Tarantula claims to have destroyed it. Instead, Goshi gives the children a beech tree sapling to plant in its place, to hopefully carry on their father's intended message in a different way. At least, I assume the final shot here is meant to be metaphorical, not literal. 
The statue lives on through their good deed, in other words. In Power Rangers, despite it serving largely the same function, the statue has become the complete opposite of its counterpart. The Forest Spirit statue is actually old, not new, and the city wants to tear it down to build a barbecue pit. Trini and the others are circulating a petition to save it, since petitioning for do-gooder causes is right in MMPR's wheelhouse. While the original statue was created to attract and celebrate wildlife, the Power Ranger statue was meant to repel it. Oh, but Trini points out that the flower ornament in the spirit's hair celebrates good bugs. Whichever ones those are supposed to be. And unlike its counterpart, the American statue ends up totally fine. I guess Rita was nice enough to put the real one back because Trini announces that their petition changed the city's mind and they won't tear it down after all. Generically happy ending. I'm not convinced the show is sure what message it wants to present in regards to various critters. The Rangers have covered their petition table in carrying cases full of live bugs, which comes across to me as vaguely threatening given the stated nature of the statue. Oh, you guys don't like bugs? Well, you better save the statue or this is gonna be your whole life right here. Bugs everywhere! The Bulk and Skull prank is to let all these bugs loose, after which they are lost and almost certainly trampled to death in the ensuing panic. For example, Tommy has no issue flattening an escaped tarantula. Jason, Trini, Billy, and Kimberly, by contrast, replace all the lost bugs with, obviously, fake props. They appear to care for the lives of their insect friends. Except when Zordon comes a-calling and Jason carelessly tosses his container on the ground. It's really weird! Zhu Ranger's message is very clearly about taking care of nature. Power Rangers' message seems to be that bugs are cool, as long as we can wring some wacky hijinks out of them. Otherwise, who cares? I also prefer how Zhu Ranger doesn't immediately give the evil plot away. We know the bad guys have done something with the statue, but everyone assumes at first that the butterflies are a good omen, the father's wish having come true. It makes the realization hit that much harder that it's an ironic subversion of what he wanted. Power Rangers combines Rita's expository scene with the earlier scene of stealing the statue so we know what the butterflies are supposed to do before we even see them in the wild. Despite their seeming lack of care towards the bugs in this episode, Power Rangers apparently got squeamish showing Rita actually crush one of her moths to demonstrate the sleeping powder inside, cutting around that one shot to make it a bit more ambiguous what she does to it. Well, I feel as though I've been picking on the Power Rangers episode long enough. While I feel the flower hair ornament as a symbol for good bugs is a bit of a stretch, I do like how it sets up Zack's realization. Trini explains the ornament to the terrified Zack, so that when he encounters the statue on his own, he recognizes it as a fake due to that difference. In Zhu Ranger, it's not explicitly set up in advance. Daisaku notices at one point that the ornament is different, so anyway, Goshi just started blasting. Like the last episode, this one continues to push a playfulness between Zack and Tommy, as the episode ends with Tommy tricking Zack with a fake spider. Zack still hasn't gotten too much focus in the series, so I enjoy that we get to see him teaching his patented hip-hop keto martial arts to a group of kids. It even provides a great excuse for Power Rangers to have a bunch of kids be the victims. And I like this bit of dialogue. A marvelous piece of Earth artwork that must have taken at least an hour to put together. Barai's only role is to play his flute. Luckily for Power Rangers, though, he decides to transform this time to do it, so that they can actually use some episode-specific footage for Tommy. In spite of that, Tommy's role is handled a bit more awkwardly this time. It's once again off to karate practice, which is already wearing a bit thin. Given how similar this episode is to the last one, I think Power Rangers made the right call by deciding to air this one out of order, placing a more distinct episode with a new Tommy excuse between these two. That helps, but this still doesn't make a lot of sense. In the previous episode, his communicator was in his gym bag, making it potentially understandable he would miss the call to action. Well, apparently he learned his lesson. Not that it matters, because Zordon just... doesn't call him until later. Do these guys have object permanence problems and forget Tommy exists when he's not tethered to the rest of the group? It doesn't seem to be a problem for Zack, who spends most of the episode by himself. And that's also a minor thing to note here. Goshi is rarely alone. All the other Zhu Rangers are with him both when he blasts the statue and when he begins his fight. They just don't transform at first. Power Rangers does a good job editing the footage to sell that Zack is totally alone. They only have to replace one shot. 
the wide shot of him shooting the statue because of all the other characters visible in it. It's pretty seamless. What's not as seamless is Zack calling out Mega Dragonzord, a form that hasn't been introduced yet, to refer to Dragonzord in battle mode or fighting mode. Okay, I guess it's become the new Power Sword. Or Mega Sword. Or Mega Power Sword. You guys really needed a consistent series bible for this show. Finally, I love how both shows give characters silly outdoor clothes to wear, be it Billy's safari gear or Goshi's... first new outfit in the entire series. Fashion, it's fun. So here we are again. Neither episode is bad, and neither is amazing. For story, it's definitely Zhu Ranger, delivering a more cohesive plot and an emotionally complex ending. For characters, it's a bit tougher. Neither is all that great in terms of its leads. Goshi is generic guy, the kids don't do much, and the other Zhu Rangers take up space. Power Rangers doesn't connect the dots well with Zack's problem, but it does throw in some moments for most of the Rangers, so I'll give it to Power Rangers. For action, Power Rangers adds a putty fight to replace the golem fight they couldn't use. Otherwise, it's more or less the same. There's really only one caveat. In Power Rangers, Jason purposely deactivates Megazord after getting caught in the spider's webbing, after which they fight in their individual zords. In Zhu Ranger, while it's not entirely clear, it appears that the webbing forces the Zhu Rangers out of Daijujin, and I like that better. It gives the monster a bit more menace. So I'll award it to Zhu Ranger, which allows it to squeak by with the win. Well, Knuckleball of Infatuation and Seven Metamorphoses, these were not. But you know what? Next is the one where Don and May and Billy and Kimberly become punks. These are among my favorites of each series, so I've been looking forward to this comparison for quite a long time. I hope you're looking forward to it too. Thanks for watching. Bondora destroyed my dad's statue. Help me buy a new one by supporting me on Patreon. No, that's not true. I don't need a statue. But your support does help me continue creating videos, and as a patron, you can see them early, among other rewards. It's fine if you can't, just let me know what you think of the video. I love engaging with all of you, and engagement helps the channel in nebulous ways I still don't fully understand, but believe in. I will see you next time!